Welcome to MMI's Minnesota Clarinetist, a virtual series where we feature Minnesota's own teachers and performers. Today, we are so excited to have Gabrielle Camposamora, who is the principal clarinetist of the Minnesota Orchestra. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. So we get a lot of questions here at MMI about you specifically. Um, oh, what, okay. How you basically started, you know, where, what's your background? So that kind of brought me to the first question that we have is what sparked your interest um, for clarinet and what may ultimately made you decide to study it so heavily? I love talking about this, uh, my origin story, if you will. Um, <laughs> I tell this story a lot. My parents are uh, jazz musicians. Uh, my dad's a drummer. My mother's a singer. And um, by all accounts, they were at some point, not anymore. They've studied quite a bit since. But by all accounts, they were what some people might refer to as street musicians. My dad, for many, many years in his career, and he was playing with um, very amazing musicians uh, in New York City, he didn't read music, for example. And my mother didn't either. It wasn't until later um, that they acquired some of those more academic skills. Uh, so in some ways, I actually look up to them because they became musicians before they became um, musicians in the academic sense anyway. They, they could hear a melody, they could hear a rhythm and play it and improvise on it. Mind you, they are very good improvisers, both of them. My mom was pretty interesting, Scott, actually. Um, and so because of that formation they had, my dad thought uh, it might be a good idea to have me study music in a more formal way. So then I was put in the uh, Instituto Nacional de Musica, which means National Institute of Music in Costa Rica. Um, it's an institute that we uh, endearingly call La Sinfonica, which just means the symphony. It's also the place where the National Symphony rehearses. Um, and so we were in contact with a lot of those musicians from an early age. Um, he put me there to acquire some of his skills when I was a kid, not knowing that I'd eventually, you know, really fall in love with the form, classical music that is, um, and want to pursue a career in it. And so it was at this institute that I first started uh, with just solfege and, uh, or sight reading uh, in English and um, recorder. So I did that for two years exclusively. See, the, the way they have it set up at the conservatory is where you cannot pick an instrument unless you're, you, you want to study a string, then you go through Suzuki much earlier. Um, but otherwise, you pretty much have to go through uh, that preparation, which I think is very helpful because by the time you start lessons with a teacher, you have already covered a lot of ground as far as music reading goes so the teacher doesn't have to spend a lot of time teaching you how to read music, for example. And so we did that for a few years and eventually I picked percussion. <laughs> and I was stuck with that for, I wasn't stuck with that, I actually loved it a lot. I was doing that for a year or half a year, half a year to a year, I can't remember. It's a long time ago. And then I took the aptitude test and I scored high enough to pick any instrument I wanted. And I really wanted the clarinet because um, I had heard the principal clarinet of the National Symphony, Marvin Araya, and I just really liked the sound. I remember distinctly liking the sound of the instrument. And so I wanted to play clarinet and the director uh, of the uh, Department of Winds and Percussion said I couldn't play clarinet because I was already studying percussion. And I remember crying to no end um, with my dad present on the main floor of the Institute. People I'm sure were watching and I think he just caved in to my tears and said, okay, fine, fine, you can, you can play clarinet, but you cannot play both. So I had to make a decision, um, which in my mind I had made, you know, prior to that. Uh, and so after that, I studied some years with a very dear teacher um, whose name is Jose Manuel Ugalde, uh, which we nicknamed, well, I didn't. Uh, he had this nickname, uh, Cheche. And um, he had left for a few years to um, obtain his master's degree at the Baylor University with um, the then teacher, I think his name, I could be getting it wrong, Richard Shane. Does that make sense? Dr. Shane? 
think so. Yeah. Think, yeah. So this would have been in the early 2000s and he came back and, and I was very excited to continue study with him. And then, sorry to take a, a bit of a, a turn here on the story. Um, he was actually, um, he was murdered uh, tragically on his way to his um, partner's house. It, there's different stories, but um, he was murdered. And all of a sudden I was left without a teacher and it was a real uh, loss for the you know, classical music community. Yeah. Not just in Costa Rica, actually. He was bass clarinet in the symphony. And, and I remember going to a concert, the concert that they were supposed, that he was, would have played that week. And it was Death and Transfiguration by Strauss and it has a couple of bass clarinet solos. So instead of hiring somebody to play for him, they decided that they would leave the chair empty and put a set of flowers in the chair. It was quite moving, actually. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, that, in a way, um, pushed me over the edge. I had always, I'd always had this idea that I would want to study perhaps in the United States or Europe. And at the time, I had some friends that had attended the interlocking arts camp, and they spoke wonders of it, which would turn out to be true. And um, I got myself a mini disc recorder. Do you remember those? <laughs> um, and, and I recorded some excerpts and, and some pieces and I just sent the tape and I got admitted into the band program. Uh, this would have been in 2005. So I went to Interlochen and um, it was there that I met my then teacher, Nathan Williams, who eventually took me into the Arts Academy and the rest is, is, is kind of history and less interesting. <laughs> uh, but I remember... Um, arriving into the United States and, and, and feeling very well excited, of course, but also, I'm not sure that intimidated, intimidating is the right word. I, I felt confused because there were many things I just wasn't used to seeing, mm -hmm. like people having their own new music, like the one you have behind you, Tori, <laughs> as opposed to photocopies of photocopies of photocopies. Uh, <laughs> And I know it might seem like something trivial, but it's something that a lot of us dealt with. Um, I, I never knew that so many people at one place could have their own functional, brand new buffet crampon clarinets. Um, <laughs> I had a great set of horns, but they were very old, and you know, I they were held together by rubber bands in some cases, because that's what the conservatory had. And I, you know, you made them work. Um, or I made them work, or we made them work. Uh, so there were, right off the bat some major differences, namely access to resources and just reads, for example, oh. and music and of course the teachers. And, and so, but people were very welcoming. There's this really wonderful story I have of this very wonderful uh, boy at the time, obviously he's an adult man that yeah. now, I haven't talked to him in years. And once I got into the academy, I was left with no instruments because I had to give the conservatory's instruments back, of course. And um, he was, I believe, leaving the academy when I was coming in. And he had also just switched from a set of Selmer clarinets to a set of Buffet Campon. And so he had two sets. Um, and it was the last day of Interlock Nars Camp. I don't know if you guys ever been there, but it's, it's beautiful. and and just thinking about it, it brings a lot of memories and nostalgia. And I remember sitting at the um, Kresge Auditorium, which is this huge open space on the sides anyway, with a lake on the, on the back. And I'm getting a little romantic here. <laughs> and um, it was the last day of camp and he had arrived there with his parents mm -hmm. and they had a sort of present for me, which was that they would lend me a set of Selmers so that I could study studying at it. Oh. I guess the reason why I'm sharing the story is because I, I want to acknowledge the fact that without people like that, and I had many people like that, I wouldn't have been able to, to get to where I am. Sure. People who were willing to help me and support me in my career. Mm -hmm. um, because at the time anyway, the thought of, of buying a set of horns for, what were they at the time? Seven grand probably the pair? Probably, yeah. Um, it's crazy because now they're close to twice as much, right? <laughs> um, 
but at the time that just didn't seem like a reasonable idea and, and here was this this uh this young man who and his parents who had had him in their hearts to to help me out and so and again i could go on and, and list dozens of people who were just as generous um does that answer your question <laughs> yeah that's a, that's a great those are great stories <laughs> you could go on <laughs> There's lots of people who have been very influential in my life um, for personal reasons or for professional reasons, yeah. for musical, artistic reasons. Okay. I don't know this, but my teacher, Yehuda Gilad, was one of my biggest influences. Sure. Um, sure. I, I think one of the reasons why he's such a good teacher was because he taught all of us very differently from each other. And he really catered to the needs of the individual. I've always been kind of a space cadet, for example. I'm, I've always had 20 things on my mind. Sure. There's probably more, a hundred, <laughs> a thousand things on my mind. So I've always struggled with focusing on one thing at a time. Uh, sometimes I overcomplicate answers. Um, and, and so he worked with me on that for a long time. He'd have me memorize a Paganini etude and nothing else for the week, just so that I could focus on one thing. Uh, that's just a, a kind of a superficial example. Yeah, I mean, yeah. His, his uh, teaching goes far beyond that. Um, okay. I'm reminded of just now of um, having a few lessons with Charlie Nidick, for example. And, uh, you know, I never, I, I didn't study with him in, like I did with Yehuda, but I, the, the little that I learned from him has been quite influential too. I'm, he's a big advocate for, let's say, well, my impression of it anyway, for, for research and for knowing what your sources are and, mm -hmm. and for a, a certain spirit of inquiry within musicianship that goes beyond just feeling the music. Right? Right. There's quite a bit of that, but also, you know, why did, when did Brahms write this? Why? Uh, what was his intention, what influenced him, so forth. Yeah. Um, and, and again, there's many people like that. Sometimes uh, there might be a guest conductor, like, um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Um, a couple of years ago, we had uh, this um, conductor from Quebec, um, whose name is Labadie. And he specializes in a lot of early music. In fact, he conducts a very famous ensemble called uh, Le Violon du Roi, the, the violins of the, of the king, I guess, or the kingship. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he really knows his stuff as far as how to interpret period music. And, and he came in, did a concert with the Minnesota Orchestra, and, and I remember just learning a lot and, and, and being excited about new perspectives. Yeah. Um, so that's, I guess, an, an example of, of someone who had a, a small influence, but just because it was small doesn't mean that it wasn't as important, right? Right. Um, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. I think we all can relate to that. You know, there's so many people that we encounter, and I think it's very important to encounter, you know, more than just one teacher, right? And get different perspectives and different experiences, and that's kind of the whole gist of getting out there and trying to experience different things instead of just always being in one bubble and pertaining to just one kind of, not just music genres, but um, that goes a long way too, you know, different conductors and people that play different instruments. I mean, sure. Yeah. I think all of those things can be very influential. So. Yeah. And it's tough. It's tough to get out of the bubble because first of all, we're very introspective people. Right. <laughs> uh, we spend a lot of time quote unquote perfecting our craft. Um, I put that on quotes because often we're doing quite the contrary right. or getting farther and farther away from truth. So between that and a culture, which is, I think, encouraging of, <laughs> let's say artistic conservatism at times, um, you could not see um, a new perspective if it was, if it were put in front of you. And so I think, you know, one has to try to to listen and to accept something that you may not know. Yeah. But if a conductor from Austria comes along and he's teaching us about the waltz in Vienna, 
I've never been to v Vienna. I've never been to Austria. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'll probably go along with what he has to say, <laughs> <laughs> despite my experience. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to make a, a case for accepting a, an argument from authority either. Sure. But maybe we should listen to more people. Yeah. So. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so kind of going off of that, um, you know, that was an incredible story about your formative years and experiences early on. Um, since then, can you talk about maybe some specific experiences or um, accomplishments that you've had since then in your musical career? I started in the Kansas City Symphony as bass clarinet and um, during my first year, I, uh, Boris Alakdaverdian moved to the Met, or he was granted tenure there. The point is he wasn't coming back to Kansas City. <laughs> and so his spot opened up, which was second and associate in E flat. And I took that audition and I didn't win. <laughs> in fact, I was runner up. Mm -hmm. I, the winner of that was Lin Ma, who is now the principal solo yeah. player of, of right. the National, National yeah. Washington mm -hmm. team. Uh, but at the time, um, he had also won, I think, a position with Baltimore. Mm. I'm pretty sure. And he opted to go to Baltimore over Kansas City. And because I was the runner-up, then I was offered a position. Um, I, you know, I, I think those things are, you know, they're, they're difficult to win. <laughs> Auditions, that is. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, even with maybe what you're doing right now with Minnesota Orchestra, that's, I mean, that's probably leads to our another question but is there anything that you've been excited or passionate about that has really kind of you know been a part of your career thus far well at the moment to be quite frank i'm, I'm just excited to play any music yeah. uh, it's been a while i just came back from Brainerd. they have this wonderful little festival up there called well, i shouldn't say little actually it's, it's, it's quite the thing now yeah uh, called the lakes area music festival um, and I went up to, to record two pieces. I recorded a Mozart E-flood serenade for wind, uh, wind octet, and also the Coolidge Taylor nonet for strings and, and winds. Wonderful piece. Okay. Um, and it was it was just nice to you know share a stage with people after a long time. Um, we were encased in plexiglass. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a challenge, and, and also with the distance yeah um you know typically i i like to sit closer to people uh, in fact i wish in the orchestra we could sit a little tighter together but that's just not going to happen for a while yeah and instead we were separated by quite a little distance and these plexiglass shields you know in front and on the sides and, and and so the way you hear things was just really awkward yeah um but but the wonderful thing about listening is that you can get used to both the space and, and some of these challenges. And so I think by the end of a week, we had worked some of those things out. And, right. and, and they have a recording up of the Cooler Taylor, the Mozart should be coming out soon. Uh, I feel like so I'm they doing recorded a little, you with a little play here for a Lynx area. <laughs> What's that? So they recorded you with the plexiglass? Sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you can watch the recording with a little kind of um, <laughs> shield. If you will, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I should say a um, um, germ shield, but it's also a sound shield, obviously, and that's that's the challenge. Right. Um, and and the Minnesota Orchestra is also starting uh, chamber music concerts this week, so we have two programs per week for the next four weeks, and then we'll see what we do yeah. thereafter. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm playing in one next next week and another one the week after for Coffee of Quintet and then Beethoven Septet. Um, we were obviously very disappointed not to go to South Korea and Vietnam. In fact, we would have returned just a few weeks ago or a month ago. Okay. Um, but everybody's on the same boat, so I don't. I don't mean to say that my life is somehow more difficult than others. Yeah. Um, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Again, everybody's going through something similar. Right. Um, right. You know, I I think it's it's. It's exciting to do new projects. For example, I'm reading a friend's piece right now. Um, he wants to put it out at the end of the month. So just 
the process of, of looking at it and, and I haven't given him a call yet, but eventually I will with some questions about how to interpret the piece. I mean, that sort of thing is, is very exciting. It's fun. Is it just solo clarinet or? Just solo clarinet, yeah. yeah. Um, that sort of thing, it's exciting to me. Yeah. I'm just gonna say, speaking of um, other activities or you know musical activities, kind of when everything was shut down a few months ago, did you, what did you do to stay motivated? Um, you kind of already talked about this other side projects and, um, and non-music things too, like riding your bike, um, other things that have kind of kept you busy. I've, I've gotten to ride quite a bit this summer on my bike. Yeah. So I've been really getting into that and especially in Minneapolis is such a wonderful mm -hmm. city to do that. Yes. I haven't really been, um, involved with music all that much or, or maybe not as much as you'd expect i've been practicing some especially lately because we're getting back to work mm -hmm. i practice some in the middle of the pen of the pandemic so far i should say yeah. um mm -hmm. but I, I took advantage of of the time and and i did something that i've never done which is to just enjoy other stuff like riding my bike like reading a little bit more studying things that I haven't gotten the chance to study before. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a weird thing because I, I've taken a month off before maybe yeah. a, a few times, but, but never like this. And, and it's, it's bizarre because I'm, you're not used to <laughs> yeah. having time to yourself or I know Tori, you have a, a kid, you probably get to spend more time than you would otherwise with your kid. Um, so that's, that's been, I mean, it's, it's been nice, but it's also been very strange. It, you get this thing on the back of your head that is telling you that you should be doing something else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do. Um, I get to spend more time with my dog. I get to ride my bike. Yeah. I get to cook, read a lot more books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of poker games with friends. To, I have a, a set of friends here in Minnesota that I, we play poker online. And I have some a, a, a different set of friends that I play with from uh, mostly the East Coast. I know it, it is such a weird feeling, you know, especially as musicians too, because there's always that nagging thing in the back of your head, like you should be doing something for your craft. <laughs> if there's anything, I guess, that you've discovered or had or kind of come back to during this time while you've been practicing, you've talked about, you know, studying things again, um, getting into mm -hmm. new things. Anything you found, new resources this is a good time to reset and to take, th take, take things slowly and to build good technique, build good habits and, and do your best to eliminate some of the bad habits. Remember muscle memory doesn't make a difference between good habits and bad habits. It's, it's habits all the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have taken some time to work on more elementary aspects of my playing by doing some long tones, by um, spending a little bit more time with articulation. And, and it's kind of amazing actually because it's lighter than it's ever been now. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that I've given the muscles involved a, a bit of rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I think moving forward, I'm probably going to work it less and, and just try to be more intelligent about how I practice that. Um, there are so many etudes out there. I mean, look at the thing behind you, Tori. Half of those things are probably etudes, and they're great. Yeah. Some better than others, obviously. Some more advanced. Yeah. You target different things. So I, I would say, first and foremost, make a list. And, and I suppose I'm speaking especially to younger students here. Make a list of what you want to work on. And from, from there, figure out what you need to do. It's kind of like going to the gym. I mean, you don't go to the gym and then pick a random machine. You first figure out what you need to work on that day. I think, I'm not a, I'm not a personal trainer, I'm not an expert, but the way I've always done it is I have a, I have a general idea. Oh, today I'm going to do my back. So then I go to the back machines, right? And I, and I do the back exercises. It's, simil it's the same concept in, 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 in laying down a, a good technical foundation. You, you want to work on, I don't know, 
if you want to work on your embouchure, you probably should do something that is low enough that you can actually pay attention to your embouchure. I probably wouldn't do Paganini if I'm working on my embouchure or my sound. There's too much going on. You're not going to have enough brain power to really focus and zero in on you know, what makes a good embouchure, what makes a good sound after. Um, I like, specifically, I, I really like Vare Mecum because it's, it's very well targeted. Um, I like Jean Jean in general, actually, because it's so targeted. I, I really feel like I'm getting a good workout, so to speak. Yeah. Um, for specific techniques. And, and other than that, I have a series of slow, uh, no, you know, long tone exercises that I alternate. I don't, I don't do them all the same day. I mean, I, I get a little bored <laughs> for like 45 minutes of long tones. <laughs> I'm not saying don't do that. I mean, I, at some point in my in my career, I certainly did that. Yes. And it was very helpful. So you might be at a point where you need to do that. Right. Um, and as you get more and more efficient, you, you can kind of dial down the the, the number of, of minutes that you use to warm up. Right. Uh, I find that to me, in, in, in uh, um, currently, it's more important that I stretch my body than playing, than warming up. I'll be more efficient. I'll be I'll be able to play more comfortably for longer if, if I've done you know a, a couple of exercises yeah. without the instrument. Right. Um, and so again, it's different for everybody. So you this is a great time to to sit down and really think with patience. Not don't grab your don't run for your horn and just play stuff mindlessly. Don't do that. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> we kind of, you kind of touched on this just a minute ago about your performances um, with Minork. So right now everything is starting um, kind of the outdoor chamber series has already started. We are programming quite a bit of different repertoire, let's say, yeah. this summer. And I hope that a lot of institutions take this opportunity and program a lot of this repertoire that hasn't been programmed before. I hope that a lot of this music makes its way to the main repertoire uh, to a point where we don't have to designate special concerts where Coolidge Taylor is just part of the repertoire and that we don't have to discuss that. And so hopefully again, classical music orchestras will see this as an opportunity to expand the repertoire, to expand their audiences uh, to be more inclusive. Um, and I've learned a lot just in the last few months listening um, to some of his repertoire. I've been lucky enough to be involved in some planning. Yeah. So you have to go through a lot of this music and, and it, some of it is unbelievable. <laughs> um, and again, I wish we didn't have to have the discussion. Uh, we didn't have to have this vetting process. Right. We're just there. Right should be there mm -hmm. yep. um, and so I invite people to come to these concerts I think that they're gonna be a lot of fun yeah they're gonna be quite diverse they're gonna showcase again new sounds and I think that's a good thing for us yes, for, for, for the orchestras yeah and I do I do truly hope that it um, it does exactly what you were just saying that it invites new audiences it invites it's more inclusive it allows for expansion on all fronts, you know. Um, so that's exciting. That is exciting to hopefully, you know, we're a part of that. So that's good. Okay, well, that was our last question. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, participating. And we look forward to seeing what you have coming up next and how the season unfolds. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks, both okay. of you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.